Permissiveness towards such dissenters makes the church appear hypocritical, ineffectual, or unwilling to hold dissenters accountable to its moral teachings. In recent years, the allowance of this cultural culture of dissent has led to crises of sexual misconduct in both Protestantism, which has been generally heterosexual misconduct, and Catholicism, which has been homosexual conduct. And I have a long footnote at the bottom that I want to come to. Well, I'll let, let me do that right now. I have some confidants in seminaries or close to seminaries that uh, informed me that this culture of dissent is already established in at least two seminaries. These confidants allege one seminary has two pairs of faculty living in same-sex unions. Only a small minority of faculty object to this, and then not publicly. Homosexuals constitute at least one-third of the student body at another seminary. There is eager, eager exploration of different sexual identities and partners, much to the shock of the heterosexual students, especially the married couples, I'm just waiting for somebody to blow the whistle. Activist Christian homosexual organizations on campus, this bears what Mertz said last night, out homosexual organizations on campus are torn by conflict between a faction that wants to be held accountable to heterosexual standards of sexual fidelity and a faction that does not want to be held or bound by them. And this confidant was tossed out of the conversations of those two homosexual groups because the one faction didn't want that confidant around. In a nearby parish, the irregularly ordained gay pastor of an ELCA con congregation confided this to this confidant that many Christian male homosexuals simply will not observe sexual fidelity in their unions. Should such dissent continue, it is not hard to envision a situation in the ELCA similar to that in the American Catholic Church, where both the vows of chastity and prohibitions against homosexual relations were flaunted with impunity by many priests. If the vulnerable, venerable institution of the celibate Catholic priesthood can thus be subverted, why not the institution of Christian marriage with its confining notions of sexual fidelity? Now, I want to go back to uh, <clears throat> that paragraph where the footnote was because there's a very important sentence here that I want to elaborate briefly on. Likewise, if it is to be the church, we've already considered this, it cannot tolerate public repudiation of its teachings by individual congregations or synods, that is, ordination to place, is that what it's called, or synods who do their own thing. That's been the Episcopal way, and it's kind of pretty much subverting the oneness of the Episcopal church. Now, his, this is the one that I think we have to keep our eye on. Nor can it tolerate a compromise in which both the traditional and revisionist perspectives officially coexist, for that means that the teaching of the church has indeed changed. There is no normative perspective on these matters. I have it from another confidant that that will be the direction that the task force will take, that people in conscience are on both sides and the church will have to live with this coexistence of conscientious positions, which, of course, means a radical change in Christian teaching. It means that there isn't any normative Christian teaching on these matters. The one church must maintain its unified normative tradition in a disciplined fashion until it is changed. Finally, the church cannot tolerate relentless and unceasing challenges to its normative teaching on sexuality. The Presbyterians and the Methodists constantly face this. They vote it down, and next year it's back, and next year it's back. Such is the route to depletion and decrease, as those churches have found. People leave. They get tired of this battle. There has to be an agreement that it, the church's settled convictions cannot be challenged indefinitely and in, unceasingly. Once a church has reaffirmed its teaching, if that indeed happens, there has to be a decent interval of surcease, continued challenges. Finally, the conclusion. Such, I believe, are the normative and pastoral principles that should hold sway in the ELCA. Much has happened in recent decades to sensitize us to the plight of our Christian homosexual brothers and sisters. Those brothers and sisters have, been made, have made us aware of the toll that harsh, sometimes violent rejection in church and society has taken on them. And I agree with last night's discussion that the church has never formally, harshly, or violently rejected <clears throat> homosexuals, but individual persons certainly have. 
I've seen it happen. Most Christians have come to the realization that we cannot treat homosexuals as modern day lepers whose whole being is denied. That is a wicked thing to do. These brothers and sisters are persons who need grace and renewal like we are. They need Christian friendship. I hope they can find some measure of gracious, graciousness in the approach I have outlined. However, I, we, cannot simply swallow hard and accept the revisionist claim that the church can publicly bless homosexual unions and allow homosexuals in partnered relationships to be pastors in the ELCA. The Bible, the Lutheran tradition, and the great Catholic and Orthodox traditions clearly come to quite different conclusions. The laity of the churches do too. In a recent survey by Barna Research, laypersons by a two to one ratio believe that homosexual relations are proscribed by the Bible. But about one-fifth of them are now uncertain. They have been confused by the current debate. The ELCA clergy are probably another matter. I would guess that they tip in the revisionist direction. Our success in preventing the ELCA from its continuing on its disastrous LPD depends upon our capacity to awaken the laity and give them, get them to project their voices. This is crucially important that the statement that comes out of this conference be made widely available to laity and clergy alike. That awakening of the laity plus demonstrating clearly that our arguments coincide with the Bible and the Lutheran tradition can summon the church to continued fidelity to its historic teaching. For this we hope and pray. <laughs>